my um, ancestry, which is my Aboriginal um, background, is uh, Bidjara from Charleville area. Um, I was raised in Harvey Bay though, so um, I'm probably a little bit more familiar with uh, the Butchler people. Um, I'm adopted as well, so uh, when I was three weeks old, so um, my um, adoptive mother used to fight for Aboriginal rights uh, right through the 60s and 70s when she moved up from Melbourne uh, up to Harvey Bay and uh, always kept me in touch with um, my ancestry. Um, uh, she is uh, a white Australian uh, and the rest of my family is too. Um, I'm obviously uh, white and <laughs> Aboriginal as well, so um, I, uh, yeah, kept just she, she helped me keep in touch with my ancestry, my Aboriginal ancestry um, through stories and, and making sure that I was in touch with the local community in Harvey Bay. Um, how I got into photography, uh, when I left school originally, uh, I first started in photographic uh, laboratories, uh, working in professional dark rooms and uh, working with um, all the 35mm medium format uh, black and white and colour negatives. Um, I used to run a, uh, a dark room for about six years, uh, which had a, a, a lab attached to it as well. So we used to do all different aspects of uh, processing and, and printing and so on by hand and all straight through machinery. Um, and I learnt my photography skills through um, just seeing the work that come in through the dark room to start with and thinking of oh, how I could um, possibly make money out of that from a from a commercial sense and uh, seeing also how I could improve on the type of uh, work I, I would see coming in with the professionals that were bringing the, the, the work through. So um, I ended up um, doing, uh, starting with portraiture in the studio and, and I went across to, to shooting weddings and, and uh, food and, um, and in the later years a little bit of um, fashion work as well. So what that's done is I've taken pretty much every aspect of photography over the last um, 30 years of learning and, and you'll see that sort of reflecting into my artwork. Um, the artwork's something that I do 100% now and I have since I started um, in 2009 and uh, yeah I don't do any commercial work anymore but pretty much every angle that I've learnt over um, that period of time since le leaving school is, is part of the artwork now. And um, I believe you were a pretty successful commercial photographer. Why would you, um, or why, why did you um, leave that sort of commercial practice to start making these sort of photographs? Um, I suppose I, I was never 100% satisfied with any type of work that I did commercially. Um, you, you're, I'm always working for someone. I'm working for um, clients or management or um, agencies. Um, someone else always had the say on, firstly, how, how the project got done and, and secondly, how they wanted it finished. So you're kind of never really working. Um, I mean, I did. Um, I never used to listen to, uh, to what people wanted. I pretty much did my own thing anyway. But um, I, the artwork allows me to, um, I suppose, start with an idea. It's, I start with a blank canvas. I, I notice that I, I just got back from overseas and, all, and a lot of photography I looked at was photojournalism style where you you basically um, find a moment and you capture that through the, through the camera. What I do with the artwork is I start with an idea in my head and then we, we work off a blank canvas and I can build up digitally the layers through photography to, to get an end product. So it allows me to work by myself and for myself and for, on my own ideas right from the start to the end and I pretty much don't have to answer to anyone but myself. So just, just the fact that it, it gives me complete freedom to do what I want is, is the reason I changed over to artwork. Plus, it's uh, great for me to uh, explore my own ancestry as well. And um, from the first works that we saw of yours in 2009, um, from Through My Eyes to now, um, you've kind of worked with... Um, history, I guess, and looking at history from an Aboriginal viewpoint, is it important to you um, to, um, you know, go back and, and, and look at Aboriginal history from a different, uh, or Australian history from a different point of view? 
Um, I suppose, and I've, I've mentioned this to a few people, um, I've sort of brought up through um, high school in the 80s, early 80s, and, and when I was at school, we didn't really learn too much about um, Australian Aboriginal history. Uh, it was pretty much uh, white settlement, and, and uh, um, back sort of then, it wasn't sort of um, probably the real history that we, we could have learned of, of Australia. So uh, as I produce the work, I, I find that every project that I do, it's kind of a learning experience for me as well. I'm, I'm slowly learning, and I mean, when I did the Prime Minister series in 2009, it, it, um, uh, it allowed me to sort of like do, a, do quite a bit of research on politics and, and who was Prime Minister and when. So it's, it's kind of, I suppose, hopefully that everyone sees in the work is a, a bit of a history lesson uh, as well. Sometimes it's, it's can be kind of like my view to a certain extent, but um, it's um, because it's, I'm learning along the way, I kind of like try and push that through in the work as well. And um, the, the way that you, you handle the subjects is, is quite interesting. Um, you know, there's quite loaded histories, but the, the way that you put them together um, is um, really quite beautiful and um, often fairly surreal as well. Uh, is that some sort of device that you purposely use in those works? Um, probably because I come from a commercial background. Um, I know that there's a fine line between sort of getting something to look a little bit too commercial. So um, I suppose what I try and do is, is make sure I don't cross that line over into the commercial photography field. I want to keep it as art. Um, the other thing I try and do with my images is, is I want them to look beautiful. Um, some of the stories that I'm telling can be quite negative, but uh, my idea is to, to bring them across in, in probably not so much a positive way, but more in a beautiful way so that people sort of can stand there and absorb the images and then think about the history of it. Um, I, um, with, with my models, I, I also use, I try and find models that aren't... Um, that have, have not done work before or, or they're not sort of out of the commercial fields like modelling agencies and so because I like to work with that that innocence of, of uh, what, you, what you see within them. Um, so a couple of the people that we've used here um, have never had photo shoots done before. It's like the first, uh, probably not this series, but the uh, Broken Dreams series and a couple of the other series I did, it was the first photo shoots that they've ever done. So I like the fact that this innocence kind of reflects through, um, and you can see the personality of each of the models. Um, Joey, which is a, uh, I've known since I was about five years old, which is him, and there's another one up there of him, on the, sitting on the horse at the end. He's the funniest character that you could ever come across, and I think that um, from the comments that I get back on the photos, uh, you kind of see that personality coming through in the images. He's always brought a lot of personality yeah. <laughs> to your work, <laughs> definitely. Um, and um, this particular series is um, titled Civilised. Um, would you mind um, explaining uh, about the idea behind the work? Uh, it's a series of 14 images uh, in total. Uh, we've done um, three from each of the countries, uh, that, including the English, but the, the first people that um, and I know there was Indonesians and, and so on that used to trade with the Aborigines, but um, I'm just talking about the, the actual recorded ones in history. So uh, they're in order from the Dutch to the Spanish. Um, French and English were around about the same time. Um, there's only two per country here, but in the actual project there's, there's three per country, plus there's a first image and a last image um, that sort of, that really don't belong to any country, but if I had to uh, get them represented by a country, it would be um, more English. Um, I come up with the idea originally um, with the, um, this one here, which is, um, it's a part of um, Captain Cook's um, monologues or journals or whatever. Um, so it's just an abstract out of that. Uh, and um, then I started doing a little bit of research on uh, the other countries that come before. I. Uh, when I was in London, I went through the, the National Gallery and I loved all the big old amazing paintings of uh, the Renaissance era and the big collars and everything. And I've been trying to work out how to, how to get that to come across into something that's got to do with our history. Um, so, I mean, te technically, if you were to really date everything on my projects, they probably don't make sense date-wise from a technical point of view. 
um, but working sort of back in around those uh, late 1500s, early 1600s allowed me to sort of sneak a little bit of that in. Um, and then it's uh, pretty much um, how we've dressed the models right through the whole series is, is my interpretation. Technically, again, it's probably not going to make too much sense. What I try and do with the projects is um, get this, uh, just the idea through. Um, not, and, and every, I find that everything doesn't have to be technically exact, um, as long as the, the general drift is sort of coming through on the project. Yeah, so the, the sort of concept comes through on, through the work rather than the kind of exact details. Yeah. yeah. Um, and um, quite a few of the works have the accompany, accompanying texts um, from the notes of the explorers on those voyages. Um, can you explain a little bit about those texts and why you chose those particular texts? Um, each of the texts actually comes from, um, like the, the one on the, the first Dutch photo is actually out of a Dutch journal, uh, same with Spain and, and France and England. Um, what I've done in the first photo of each section, I've put the original flag um, roughly around about that era into the image somewhere. So on the first Dutch one, it's in the front of the Bible. Um, on the, sec on the, the second one up the top there, the Spanish, oh, actually it's not. Oh, that one's not up there. There's a um, Spanish one with a ship in the background. It's actually hanging off the mast of the ship, the, the old Spanish flag. Um, the French one, there should be one there with it um, on the sand. Um, so I built the flag in to let you know which country uh, that the, that set of three images represents. Um, and then I've taken the text from each of the journals of that country and, and put it in. Some are um, quite negative. I think the depth is the fact that you can read what they used to um, write down about the Aboriginals after seeing or meeting them for the first time and, and how they... Um, saw our Aboriginal people, so which comes back to the whole title of the the project, which is called Civilised, and it's about the fact that these countries used to come along and look at the Aboriginal people and look at them as being completely uncivilised. So the question with the project is why were they looked at as being quite uncivilised? It's, it's basically because um, the European explorers didn't understand the Aboriginal culture, so what I've done with the series is I've I've dressed them in a way that um, European explorers would see them through their eyes as being more civilised. And um, in your own eyes, what makes somebody civilised, I guess? Um, I'm probably asking the question with the project on what makes... I'm doing a, a political answer here. <laughs> Um, of what makes a person civilised. So I kind of, I'm asking a question and I'm saying, what is it? Is it dress? Is it um, cultivating the land? Is it um, living in a built-up society? Um, is it fashion? Is it hair? This is all the things that I've used in the project um, to create the images. It's, we've used makeup artists and hairstylists and elaborate clothing and everything to, to is this what it takes to give or to, to make someone look civilised? Because um, if you understood how Aborigines lived on the land and, and cultivated the land and everything, um, it's, it's just something that uh, I feel that European um, settlers didn't understand and, and pretty much looked at Aboriginal people as being part of the flora and fauna. And, and um, the, the text that you see in the images actually explains that. And um, I noted um, with interest that um, all of the texts were by the, uh, or from the journals of the White Explorers, except for one, which was from a um, senior man at Aracoon in response to that. Um, why did you use that particular quote in the series? Um, I felt that it really suited the first image. Um, I've only used the, an Aboriginal quote on the actual first image of the, uh, not the first one, but the first one of the first country. Um, so I, re I read that story about the text kind of makes sense. It's this whole connection with the first time that um, uh, recorded wise that um, a European would have come in and sailed the, the ships in up north and, and first contact 
in seeing an Aboriginal person and, and how they actually thought about seeing that person. So I thought it was um, good to use that on the actual first image. Um, and I know I've, a lot of people have sort of said, oh, where, where have you found the text and how, how did you come across it? It's um, basically um, a whole lot of Googling and Wikipedia and sitting at home for hours on end trying to find this stuff. So, and, and trying to make sure that it, you're getting the right information as well. Um, so hopefully it's kind of correct. <laughs> we're, we're going pretty well here, um, but I would um, like this to be interactive and I'd like for any um, questions um, from the audience to be fielded. So if anybody has any questions they'd like to ask, uh, Michael would be happy to take them. I'll, I'll run with the microphone so you, you don't have to shout. The, the other thing I just would mention too with the series is um, these um, explorers that come along um, from, or from where it's been recorded, which is early 1600s, um, something to think about would be that um, Australia necessarily might not have got settled by the British and we could have ended up being French or Dutch or, or Spanish or pretty much um, any explorer that settled Australia, so, which would have been a completely different um, past and, and present for us. If you had it included the Indonesian contact with the, with the Aboriginals, what, how would you depict that? Um, I, I purposely didn't because I wanted to um, go off the, rec the what's recorded in our history books. Um, the reason being is that um, I think there's been a lot of contact by a lot of different races and I, I kind of didn't know where, where to stop and, and there was nothing official and I would have been questioned over and over and over about who I was including and who I wasn't. So. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and so. I, also I think that the Indonesians sort of um, came for reasons of, you know, contact and, and, and trade and, and had that, um, you know, over 400 year link um, established and they never really tried to take over. Uh, whereas this is about conquest and about, you know, making judgments on other people. Um, so I think it would have not quite fit. So, some of the things I've also used in, in the um, project, um, actually that's one of the other ones too. Um, one of the Dutch, the second image in the series is a, a Dutch image and I've used uh, the Dirk Hart hog plate sitting in the sand, um, which is the first recorded sort of um, thing left here by a white person. So um, how I got that is I actually photographed um, my own plate and overlaid the text um, across the plate. So it's, it's almost a, um, sort of a representation of the Dirk Hart hog plate sticking up out of the sand below this Dutch guy. So. <laughs> Um, I've, I'm enjoying the atmosphere of the, uh, the photographs and they're kind of amorphous. There's no horizon line there really, is there? Um, so they're just, is it, is it true to say that, you know, the, the edge where they're on the edge of the sea, where the sea meets the land, the sort of literal zone is where these two civilizations are emerging? Um, is, is that symbolism what you had in mind? Or? I, I kind of wanted this whole mysterious thing happening. Um, the reason I've, I've photographed them uh, the reason they're all sort of standing on the beach is I, I feel that that's that first contact. Um, Aborigines would have seen the tall ships coming in. Um, it would have been it, like it all probably happened on the beach, this whole first um, sort of mysterious thing that uh, between Aboriginal people and white people. Um, and by, I, I, I like, with my photography, what I like to do, I, I'm completely photographic based um, and I, I layer up digital images so what I like to do is almost confuse people in a way that they kind of like got to walk up to the image and and look at it to find out whether it's actually a photograph or not so with the overlays and everything that I've used on the images I'm, I'm trying to get that and by fading the horizon out I'm just trying to get this um, mysteriousness happening and, and uh, I think that almost takes you like I was mentioning before I like to take it a, because I'm I come from a commercial background I like to pull it away from commercial as much as I can um, without going so far that it looks like technically bad so, <laughs> so I there's a fine line in, in getting that correct and with me with some of my works lately it's, it's just being created through working with overlays and, and, and actually putting this sort of um, overlay on it to, to give it uh, more of a mottled look. 
it, yes, it's like it's like you know an, a process in etching, isn't it? You know, you're getting this lovely sort of stippled, foggy but soft, foggy. Atmosphere. Yeah, yeah, and um, the number of overlays I use can be uh, it can vary. Sometimes a lot of the times I kind of make my own. Um, sometimes it, it, it's work. I, I scan the back of my old photos and stuff from my family album and so on to get some of the moulds and some of the the, um, the the look that I need to, to finish the image the way I want it to be. Um, I was just going to ask about the playing card, I think it is. Would you like to speak about that? Uh, um, that is um, the um, French flag from roughly that period of time. Um, and um, yeah, it's same again, uh, searching around on Wikipedia, trying to get the dates sort of as close as I can. Actually, I think the flag was a little bit earlier than what the photos time frames should be, but <laughs> I really liked the design of it and I thought it was quite different to um, how the French flag is now. So uh, it's, I think it's roughly about, about the same, but um, as, as I suppose as far as um, history goes, I don't think the French sort of supposedly come here until um, sort of the mid 1700s, but the flag's probably a little bit earlier than that. Um, Someone could probably correct me there, but. <laughs> as soon as you said the French flag, I thought, yeah, got it. <laughs> Michael, I was wondering whether you could say a little bit about your experience in London with your recent solo show there? Yeah, I um, just. Um, a few weeks ago I, I showed uh, at October Gallery uh, in London and I showed a series of ten, ten images called Broken Dreams. Um, the whole series, um, I've used Larissa, which is this girl here um, in the complete series that was shown over there. Um, I, I did Larissa's um, first ever photo shoot and uh, she has this like um, beautiful innocence uh, in her personality and, and um, I find her really quite easy to photograph because um, the same again she has like a, a very nice personality um, and um, she just pretty much gives me the look that I need um, probably because she has no expectations about um, what to expect when you come to a photo sh shoot so um, she she, and she does the opposite to how I represent her in the photos. Like um, when we do photos, it's, they're very styled. Um, we have makeup artists and stylists and usually shoot it at a big commercial studio or whatever. And it's kind of like a fashion shoot. Um, but um, she probably doesn't mind me, me saying this, but she drives the, the big um, trucks on, in, on the mines. Um, so it's, it's kind of the opposite to sort of experiencing a, a photo shoot how I would normally put one of those together in uh, to, to, bring a, to bring a project together. Um, so yeah, we had a, a series of ten, 10 images that we showed over in London uh, and it was uh, pretty well received. Um, it's uh, I had a, a pretty good turnout and um, it, it's good to uh, show Australian history in a, in a place where um, ha like from, a, from our background uh, for the last 250 years. I, I say that, um, I was actually a few weeks ago, I was standing in Captain Cook's attic or where he lived for nine years while he did his um, training when he was um, living, uh, living over and learning all of, I think from the ages of 19 to 27. Um, he lived in, a, in an attic in Whitby and I was actually there, it's a museum now. And I went downstairs and I said to the guy, um, how come there's hardly any representation, I don't think there was any representation of Aboriginal people in this museum or pretty much not much representation of Australia. And he said, well, basically Captain Cook was hardly here. He like spent more time in Tahiti and other places, but and he dropped into Australia for a, for a short amount of time. And I just thought that was really interesting that we based sort of our history on that and, uh, but kind of as far as they're concerned, he was only here for a very short amount of time. So. <laughs> um, well, I think we've um, 
kind of exhausted our time, um, but it's been fascinating. And um, I'd like to just ask everybody to please thank Michael for a great talk. Thank you.